Okay, uh, this is going to be a, a brief video on the uh, display unit itself. Uh, this is the display unit all boxed up. Um, and I'm going to remove the uh, cover here pretty soon. Uh, let me turn it around first and show you the back side. Um, there's uh, some connectors on the back side. There's a BNC antenna on the very top. This goes up to the uh, direction finding antenna. And uh, let me show you a, a cable that attaches to that. Uh, and I'm going to stop the camera here for a second. Okay, this is the uh, this is a cable that I got uh, uh, for uh, attaching the uh, main antenna cable to the uh, display unit. Um, the main antenna cable is uh, pretty thick and it's pretty inflexible, so it might be kind of hard to uh, attach it to this. So I decided to get a, uh, a much smaller and much more flexible uh, two-foot uh, cable. Um, and this is it. And uh, you'll see on one end it's got a BNC plug, and on the other end it's got a BNC uh, female jack. Uh, this part here will actually mate with the cable coming down from the antenna. And this part here will mate with the BNC on the display unit. And I'll show that now. Okay. Here's the cable uh, with the BNC installed on the display unit on the back side. This is the other end of the cable. And uh, this will mate actually up with the, uh, with the cable that's coming down from the antenna. And the reason I did this is because I wanted to provide two feet of flexible cable so that uh, this thing wouldn't be, uh, its location wouldn't be uh, dragged around by the mass of the antenna cable, the main antenna cable. So you've got two feet of flexible cable here, so you've, that will allow you to, uh, uh, you can run this to the main cable, and that will give you some flexibility as to where you want to install the uh, display in it. You don't have to, you won't be fighting with the antenna cable in order to get it to, get it to be where you want it to be. Okay, so in addition to this, uh, you've got a, a DB9 uh, female connector here. This goes to the control cable, which goes up to the antenna. That's a smaller cable, so that shouldn't uh, cause you any trouble with flexibility. And then finally, you've got uh, uh, some five-way binding posts here, uh, which uh, are for the power input for the unit. You can feed it to 12 to 15 volts. Uh, red is positive, black is negative. Uh, you can use uh, banana plugs if you want. It'll, it'll accept those. You can also uh, unscrew these things and um, uh, you can feed uh, wires in underneath and uh, you'll, you'll figure it out. Just uh, that's where the power goes in, uh, 12 to 15 volts DC. And um, that's basically all there is to the back of the panel. So anyway, disconnect this now and we'll uh, go around to the front and uh, get into some business stuff. This cable here is uh, temporary. This is a test cable that I installed in order to provide power uh, so I could demonstrate it. Uh, so this won't ship with it. You can uh, provide your own wiring to go to these two terminals here for power. So, and with that, onto the, uh, onto the front. Okay, here we are on the, on the uh, front. Uh, gonna, uh, it's got two latches. There's one here and one here. And I'm going to open those up now and uh, drop the cover off the box and reveal the interior. And there's the direction finder. My computer uh, screen is in the background. Uh, and this is the direction finder unit. And uh, before I go any further, let me point out that this uh, cover um, can be completely removed um, with a bit of work. So uh, that's a little more convenient. That will uh, prevent this thing from getting in the way on your desktop or wherever you're going to install this thing. The, uh, there are two hinges here. Um, and the hinge pins are made of metal. There's two of them. There's one here. And there's one here. And uh, you can remove these hinge pins completely. And if you do that, that will allow you to completely detach this top cover and uh, put it somewhere else and get it out of the way. And that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to detach these with a pair of pliers. Just pull them out. This one you pull out uh, this way. Uh, this hinge pin pulls out this direction. And once you pull them out, I would suggest that you put them back into the uh, back into the uh, unit here so that you don't lose them. And then that way you can get rid of this. Or you can put this uh, top cover somewhere and uh, just get it out of the way so it's not so much, so much of a hassle. Okay, there's the top cover removed with the two hinge pins. 
And there's the display unit. I'm going to push this out of the way right now. And I'm going to put the hinge pins back in here so that I don't lose them. And then I'll uh, go on to uh, demonstrate the display and uh, describe the controls and such and uh, get on with this video. Okay. Uh, hinge pins are uh, reinstalled uh, into the main uh, display unit so they won't get lost. And um, right now I've got a, an external uh, DC power supply hooked up to this unit, but it's not turned on. Uh, there's the power supply. Right now I'm giving it about uh, eight and a half volts. That's really enough to run it. You need at least seven volts in order to run this thing. So um, bear that in mind. And uh, you can actually put in more than 15. Uh, I'm not entirely sure how high you can go. I probably wouldn't suggest any more than 24, but uh, I would I would suggest that you keep it at 15 or less. So um, this is the front panel with all the front panel controls. Uh, they're all labeled. Um, there's three uh, toggle switches and some uh, other connectors and uh, some push button switches here. This is the main display. And I'm gonna turn the power on now. Here's the power switch. And as you can see, um, the display is going through a self-test and um, just finished that. And right now there's no signal coming in. So you're getting dashed lines and the Polaris display is uh, just going around, running around in a circle hunting. So it's waiting for a signal. <coughs> okay. Um, there's a, um, switch here, or, or I'm sorry, a, a jack here, the 3.5 millimeter uh, stereo phone jack, mini phone jack, uh, where you can get uh, basically a copy of the audio coming from the receiver. The receiver is behind this uh, this panel here. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, and this was added because um, Soji indicated he might want to record some of the audio coming from the receiver. So uh, with this uh, with this jack here, you can feed a cable from here over to your IBM PC, and I found some software that you can use to uh, actually record the uh, the radio traffic uh, and use this thing as a radio receiver as well as use it as a direction finder. So that's what this jack is for, and I'm going to provide the cable for it. Also, a 10 foot cable. It's a uh, once again, it's a 3.5 millimeter stereo uh, uh, jack. Uh, and they're very common. They're used quite a bit. Uh, they go uh, for uh, 3.5 millimeter jacks are used for microphones and headsets on uh, IBM PC. So they're very common. They should be pretty easy to find. Okay. In addition to that, there's also a DB9 uh, female connector here, which uh, goes to the print, uh, to your personal computer, your PC. And uh, I provided a cable for that as well, which will go from this type of connector into a uh, USB connector because uh, nobody uses this type of connector on PCs anymore. And um, that will allow you to use your PC as a display, uh, which uh, I offer two uh, uh, display programs on my website for free. And uh, this will run either one of them. And uh, I'm not gonna try to talk about that uh, in, this, uh, in this video, but uh, that's what the connector is for. So you can go from here to your PC using a USB adapter and I'll provide the USB adapter as well and another 10 foot cable. And um, that will allow you to display this, uh, display this, this uh, DF readout on your PC. I've got two display programs that will run on the PC. One of them has got a, sim a display similar to this, but the, uh, another one uh, that will display on Google Earth, which uh, might be uh, more appealing in some ways. Uh, um, and uh, more interesting too. So, but I'm not going to talk about those in this video. In any event, um, the receiver actually is a general purpose uh, 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 VHF, VHF UHF scanner, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But uh, there's uh, when the when the direction finder is actually working, it generates a very uh, obnoxious audio whine in the audio and it's pretty hard to understand what people are saying with that whine running. So uh, for the times that uh, Soji wants to use this receiver as a ordinary communications receiver, I provided a switch here to turn the direction finder on and off. And when you turn the direction finder off, 
uh, what will happen is that the whine will go away. Uh, the direction finder doesn't work in that case, but uh, you'll be able to hear the audio clearly then. And uh, so that's that's what this switch is on, switch is for. It's it's basically you el eliminate the whine in the audio, so that you and uh, turn the direction finder off, uh, so that you can uh, listen to whatever is uh, traffic is on the channel. So that's what that's for. So you got your DF on off switch, your power on off. This is your audio monitor. Uh, this is your uh, remote display connector. And uh, this switch here is basically a speaker mute. This thing has an internal speaker also to uh, uh, play the audio coming from the receiver. The receiver speaker is turned off because I had to, in order for the DF to work, I had to put a plug into it and that defeats the internal speaker. So there is an internal speaker in the DF here and you can turn that speaker on and off with this uh, speaker mute switch. Um, and the reason for that is that when the direction finder is working, you might not want to sit there and listen to that audio whine. So uh, you can turn the speaker off if you don't want to listen to it. But you might want to turn the speaker on if you're using it as a communications receiver. So that's what that's for. <coughs> the last thing here is these uh, three push button switches. Uh, there are three push buttons on top and three push buttons on bottom. Uh, this has got a, a digital readout from 000 to 999. Uh, this is the calibration control. And uh, if you push these buttons, it'll actually increment or decrement the, the associated digits. I'm going to press the, the hundreds digit now. This is the plus button. And as, you, as I push it, you'll see the number goes up. And if I push the down button, you'll see that the number goes down. Okay. Now the purpose of this is to basically electrically adjust. You can electrically you can electrically rotate the antenna uh, in order to correct any errors that might exist in the antenna. In other words, when the antenna is installed, um, it may be pointing in the wrong direction. And if that's the case, then uh, if you want this thing to indicate you know the correct direction to the aircraft, <coughs> you'll need to electrically rotate it using these controls. Normally what you'll do is, is you will identify the correct number and write it down. You'll never have to change it again. Uh, but I decided I wanted to add this uh, feature so that you could, if you wanted to, you could get the, uh, you could indicate the direction, the bearing to the aircraft. Or if you put in a different number, you can indicate the bearing from the aircraft to the airport, which might be useful. So you can do the to from uh, feature on here, similar, similar to the operation of a VOR. Uh, you can also do it in either magnetic or true bearings. So, you know, you can also include your uh, magnetic variation value in this correction if you want. So uh, this allows the operator to enter uh, any one of those four numbers and then you can get uh, magnetic or true bearings and you can get bearings to or bearings from the aircraft. So that's why I provided this feature and uh, put it on the control panel here where the operators can get a hold of it. So that's what that's about. I'll talk more about how you identify uh, the numbers and so on and so forth. But this thing basically has enough authority to rotate to this display a full 360 degrees. Actually, it's full 512 degrees, which is almost one and a half complete turns. So when the antenna gets installed, you can basically point it in any direction you please, and it's not important. Uh, there's going to be errors, and once it's installed, you can figure out what the errors are, and you can use this to correct them. You don't have to go back up up to the uh, top of the mast and you know loosen the antenna up and move it around. You can do all that down here with this. That's what this is about. So that's the uh, that's the DF calibration uh, buttons, and that's what that does. Okay, now I'm going to go look at the receiver a little bit here. Uh, this uh, this panel basically just hides the receiver because most of the time you won't have to use it. And um, I got kind of a, I had to use an ICOM R6. There's a, um, there's a tie wrap uh, loop here that you can tug on in order to open this panel up. And um, it's a little hard. You can pull this panel completely out like that. And that reveals the radio. Now the radio is not turned on or off by this by this switch here by this power switch, okay. 
This switch only turns the direction finder on and off. To turn the radio on or off, you have to turn off the radio itself. And there's a, control, there's a button here. This is an ICOM R6 handheld scanner. And um, uh, it's actually uh, a very versatile device. This thing will tune not only the uh, uh, general aviation uh, frequencies of 118 to 136 for communications, but it will also tune uh, the uh, military airband, which runs from 225 to 400 megahertz. And uh, uh, when this thing is being used for the direction finder, it must be set to detect FM signals. Uh, even on the even on the airband of AM, uh, but the, the Doppler direction finder requires FM detection, so you've got to set this for FM to use the to use the direction finder. I think for for uh, military airband two twenty five to four hundred, I think that's FM all the time. But in general aviation, the uh, low band uh, one eighteen to one thirty six is AM modulation. So if you're using this thing for a direction finder. You've got to set it for FM detection. If you're using it uh, as a monitor to listen to the uh, 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 general aviation uh, voice traffic, you've got to set it to AM. And that's something that you've got to do with these controls here. Uh, you can go look up the uh, information, learning how to use this. It's a, it's a very complicated device, but it, it's, you know, it's not too bad to learn how to use it. You'll have to, you'll have to operate this separately. And in order to make that a little bit easier, I've, I've added enough slack on these cables so you can pull this thing completely out. And, um, uh, you know, that, this will allow you to uh, actually change the settings and everything else without too much difficulty. Um, these uh, cables on the top, uh, this one is a, uh, the antenna cable. This is an SMA cable, which unthreads. Um, this is a, another 3.5 millimeter audio cable that plugs into the speaker. And uh, these uh, connections uh, tie the radio to the rest of the direction finder. <coughs> but you can also use this thing as a separate receiver if you want to. <coughs> and you can um, disconnect this stuff, which I'll do now. Okay, there's the audio cable disconnected. And I'm going to disconnect the uh, antenna. Let me try this, the... Uh, Okay, there's the cables disconnected. There's the radio. Um, the radio was pr provided with a um, an antenna, which I usually keep it inside of the same compartment here, just stuff for in there. So if you want to use this thing as a portable radio, a portable handheld radio, uh, you can do that. You know, you just uh, this antenna will screw onto the uh, SMA connector here. Now, you know, you've got a, uh, just a plain old ordinary handheld radio. Okay. The power switch is here. <coughs> I'm going to shift this to uh, tune for 127. <coughs> yeah, tune for 127 megahertz. And um, you'll have to, you'll have to read about, you'll have to read the book to learn what all these controls are. Um. There are some uh, buttons on the side here. Uh, there's a squelch defeat. That's impressed to get audio. And there are other buttons on this side. I'm sorry, the, the, these are jacks on this side. There are jacks here for a uh, charger. And there is a charger plug in this direction finder. That's this orange cable here. I'll pull it out. And you can use this to charge the batteries in here. So I just usually leave it stuffed in here. There's a uh, foam rubber padding in here to hold the radio in place and give it a little bit of uh, shock absorber. So uh, that's normally where I stick this cable. So this has uh, this is powered by two AA batteries. Right now it's got some nickel metal hydride uh, rechargeable batteries in here. They're fully charged uh, when I ship this. And uh, you can get about 10 to 12 hours of operation out of them. Um, and it takes about four, 13 hours to fully charge the batteries. Uh, you could have to read in the, in the manual about how to charge the batteries. Uh, it's, it's more complicated than I want to try to describe in this video. But um, 
this uh, this radio can tune both uh, the uh, general aviation uh, VHF um, uh, comm channels and also the military uh, uh, UHF uh, comm channels. So you'll just have to read about that in the book. So, uh, but it's a great radio. The, the ICOM is a really great company. They make really good radios. I've tested this uh, twice as a direction finder and it works great. So, um, and it's a, and it's a great receiver in general. So, uh, yeah, if uh, if you're inclined to uh, play with that kind of stuff, uh, feel free to go ahead and do it. Yeah, the ICOM user's manual is uh, available on the internet. And uh, I'll, I think I'll include a copy of myself uh, on the thumb drive. And um, um, it, it's a great radio. So I'm going to put all this stuff back in the uh, enclosure here and, and then put the... Uh, Put the cover back on, but uh, that's the radio, and that's where it's at. Normally, once you set the controls for this thing, you really won't have to touch them again, so there's no reason for to uh, leave this thing exposed. And um, so that's uh, that's why it's hidden when it's not being used. Uh, the only time you really need to get access to this thing is when you're going to be changing the control settings. So that's uh, that's pretty much it for the display. Uh, let me uh, close this back up again, and I'll. Uh, uh, do one last short video and uh, close out this uh, description of the display unit. Okay, there's the radio reinstalled on the uh, display unit. Now I'm going to stuff the uh, flexible antenna in here just to keep it here for storage purposes and then put the cover back on. Okay, there's the cover. It's uh, put back on. Uh, uh, just over here on the side, uh, there's, a, uh, there's a little tiny nub of a uh, quarter 20 screw which sticks out from the side of the wall. That's what provides the latch mechanism that holds this door shut uh, when it's all installed back in here. In order to uh, disconnect it from that latch, what you, all you need to do is grab this ring and pull this door uh, very slightly out and uh, maybe pull it a little bit in this direction in order to get it over, get that, uh, get the lip of the, uh, the cover off over the side of that screw. And then you'll be able to pull this uh, this out. So let me see if I can uh, get that. Just give it a tug, give it a good tug, and uh, maybe, uh, yeah, just give it a good tug and it'll, it'll come out. And that's, that's the display unit. So I'm going to put the, uh, uh, the main cover back over this whole thing and lock it up and close it up, turn it off. And um, that's the that's going to be the description for the display unit. Uh, one last point on the um, the receiver: the receiver takes two AA size batteries. You can use nickel metal hydrides. That's what I've stuck in there now. I'll give you a couple of spare nickel metal hydrides. I'll also give you some AA alkaline batteries. If you use alkalines, uh, those are not rechargeable, so uh, you'll have to throw them away when they're dead. Uh, but it's also important that you do not ever try to charge this thing up if you've got ba alkaline batteries installed because they'll explode if you try to recharge them. So just be aware of that. And um, that should be pretty much it. I'll take one final shot with the cover back on and uh, call this video uh, finished. Okay, cover's back on, latches are latched. The uh, hinge pins are all back partially installed. I guess I should point out also there's uh, a couple of uh, feed extensions that I've added to the bottom of this thing. Uh, this thing was uh, pretty unstable and it would tip over very easily. So I added these for that purpose to make it more stable and flexible when, you, when you're standing it upright. It uh, makes it much solid and much more, much less likely to fall apart. So that's it. I'm going to remove this, uh, this test cable and uh, ship it off to you guys. So that's the display unit. And uh, thanks for your attention. Adios. Okay, actually I decided I was going to add a couple more uh, short uh, video clips uh, to uh, demonstrate the IBM uh, display programs. Uh, this is one of the programs here. This is called Windop. It's available on my website. And um, uh, this basically will can be driven by the... Uh, Doppler direction finder. Right now, I don't have it hooked up because I don't have an antenna hooked up to my uh, to the Doppler. 
but I'm going to uh, put this thing in, into a test mode to give you a simulation of what uh, uh, what the display will look like if you're getting real signals on it. And uh, over here on the right, there's a control panel. I'm going to click the test button, and uh, it starts uh, ind indicating uh, uh, simulated readings. The uh, the length of these individual uh, uh, radial uh, spurs and lines uh, indicates how many times this the direction finder uh, got a bearing from that particular direction. So uh, even though there are there are radial lines in all kinds of different directions, you can see uh, as the simulation proceeds that most of the bearings are coming from this direction around two four five two four zero two two four five degrees. And uh, so that would be the indication of the direction from which the signal is coming from. Uh, you can see also that it's uh, displaying these uh, range rings on here. Each one of those range rings indicates uh, 10 readings on a particular bearing. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to turn the uh, turn this off for a second. I'm going to count the rings. And I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So that means I've got 120. So far, I've gotten 120 bearings uh, coming from this direction. So that gives you some idea of how much confidence you can put into the uh, readings that you're getting. Uh, the Doppler direction finder normally produces about uh, 15 bearings a second. So it's you can you can you can acquire this many bearings uh, really very quickly. Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the uh, Acquire back on again. Uh, there's a button here to clear the display. Um, if you uh, if you want to start again, and uh, you can quit the program as well. But I just wanted to show you that. That's uh, that's the window program, and that's basically the same uh, direction finding information that's displayed on the DF unit, except that this also gives you the history readings of the past DF readings as well. Uh, and that's uh, that's why one one of these uh, plumes is much bigger than all the others. Is that's the one where most of the bearings have come from. So you get to see uh, not only the real time readings, but also the, a history of the past readings for as long as uh, as long as you've been uh, looking at it. So this is called Windop W I N D O P P, and it's on my website. And uh, you can you can download it and install it on, on an IBM PC. So I'm going to, uh, that's the end of this, uh, this video. Uh, so now I'll go on in the next clip. Okay, uh, this is the second display program that you can use with the direction finder on your PC. Uh, this is actually um, a uh, shot from a YouTube video uh, that a friend of mine made of, a, of the direction finder uh, running at his house. Uh, it's a, uh, this is a, uh, a display on uh, Google Earth, and this is showing the direction finder. And right now, that's the direction finder is running in test mode, and it's uh, oops, well, that's all there is to it. I'm going to rerun it, replay it again. Uh, the direction finder is rotating clockwise at a rate of uh, one RPM uh, slowly uh, in the test mode. But if there was an actual uh, direction finder driving it, uh, there would be no bearing line unless uh, there was a signal on the channel. Uh, and it would point at the it would at, it would point in the direction of the signal in that case, but this is called uh, Dopsite D O P P S I T E, and uh, this is a video off of YouTube. But the program itself uh, can be driven from the Direction Finder, and uh, it can be downloaded from my website. And you can ask for information about how to how to set it up. It's uh, it's pretty slick, and. Um, I just want to show you those two display programs that you can run on your PC and um, uh, give you an idea of what, uh, what, the, what the DF is capable of. So that's it. Adios. Uh, end, of, uh, end of story.